Be seated, be seated, but we're in this thing called church folks. Somebody say church folks. Here's, here's again, uh, church folks, y'all. Uh, the, the, the main idea I want you to have during this series, this first point, I really want you to have it because the question I have for us is, are we doing what God said? Uh, and the first thing I want us to identify is that and what we have to do is close the gap between what God says and what we say. Who we are and what we do. Next idea I really want you to have, you got to write this down because oil is not meant to be stored. It's meant to be poured. And so I need you to know that oil, catch this next point, write this down. Oil does not flow if you're planning to spend it on just you. Oil does not flow if you're only planning to spend it on you. Because oil is not meant to be stored. It is meant to be poured. Elijah is sent by God on an assignment to a brook called Kareth. We talked about it and discovered it last weekend. And then after that brook dried up, God sends Elijah to a city called Zarephath. And his assignment in that city was to meet his provision that was coming through a widow woman. Something interesting here that we have is two characters in this story. But watch this. Both persons, their next is tied to their obedience regarding each other in the now. Let me say it again. You got Elijah and you got this widow woman. And both of them can't get to the next level in God until they obey him in the now. Oh, that's a word for your life. The widow woman has to obey God in regards to Elijah. And Elijah has to obey God and go to Zarephath and find this woman. Catch this next piece. I need you to have it. This is a good one. Take, the, take a picture of the screen. These are in your app. Vertical relationship with God must meet the horizontal relationships of our lives. And the purpose of the church is to help these two directions meet. Let's leave it there for a second and really let that, let's work with that. Vertical relationship with God has to meet the horizontal relationships of our lives. The purpose of the church is to help those directions meet. So let's discover what these are. Let's go to the next piece. Let's discover what these are. Vertical relationship is us to God. Okay? Vertical relationship is you and God. Horizontal relationship is believer to believer. It's your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I say all the time, and I'm here today, let me upset you right quick now. We'll be friends in a minute that you can't really say you love God if you don't love his people. You can't say you got relationship with God if you don't want to have relationship with his sons and daughters. Oh help me I need you to know something that God says uh, Jesus said in the scripture he said you'll know my disciples by their love oh come on ain't nobody gonna know you love Jesus because you know how to shout and dance nobody cares what time you get to church nobody cares what title and position you hold in the church if you don't love people like Jesus then nobody will know that you belong to Jesus and so horizontal relationship is believer to believer and that is crucial to your relationship with God it's important people of God that we discover that we have to speak the language of faith. You have to let faith come out of your mouth. Faith has a sound. And so does defeat. Have you ever talked to a defeated person? Have you ever talked to a defeated person and everything that comes out of their mouth is negative? 
Well, I'm, I mean, I'm glad God is doing stuff for you because I just don't really feel like he's doing too much in my life. I mean, I've been out here trying. I've been praying and striving, and I just don't really feel God moving. Ah. I know God is a healer, but I just don't know if God's going to heal me. Faith. Faith conversation. Catch this. Faith conversation is about remembering what God already did and pushing you to believe for what he's going to do next. So faith conversation, while it respects the facts, it's not limited by what you see. The language of faith moves in my life because I believe based on what God said. This widow said her and her son were going to die. Now, this is crazy to me because it sounds like us to me. Like when I read this text, it sounds like church folks. Somebody shout church folks. Because, because now, now I don't want to offend nobody. Please don't let this run you out of church today. But I, this is the only way I can say it, and it makes sense. Catch this next piece. Because we dance for victory, but we speak the language of doubt. See, we walk in the title of child of God, but we live in the language of bastard. I'm so tired of people saying I'm a child of God, but speaking like your daddy don't love you. Help me, Holy Ghost. I don't know what happened to the church in what generation we lost faith. I don't know what generation we, I don't know what year and what decade we stopped believing God. But now something happened where church didn't have value and priority, where relationship with God don't matter, where the spiritual matters and stuff don't have any weight in our lives. And something else happened where we stopped believing. I don't know about you, but I've seen too many miracles to not believe that God has still got power to work miracles. I've seen God move too much. I've seen God do too much in other folks for me to not believe that he's going to do it in me too. Uh, so, so, So I struggle with the idea that we walk and call ourselves children of God, but we live like people who don't have a father. We've been speaking over our children. People have been speaking over us, but none of that matters when God has spoken over your life. You have to see this woman, and I'm not going to sit in this too long because it's one of my, it's my message next week, but you got to understand that this woman says, didn't just say that her life was doomed, she said her and her son's life was over. You got too many people speaking over your life right now, and you don't. If you don't speak the language of faith, then you'll never see God move and do what he's trying to do in you because the only thing that's happening is what they say is impacting how you believe. That's why Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, don't stop coming to church because when you come, there's encouragement there for you. And I need like four believers in the room who would really catch this revelation because I need to just really put this in your spirit that, that, that when you come to church and you see what God is doing in your brothers and sisters, it's not for you to hate and be jealous. It's for you to believe that if he did it before, he can do it again. So I'm not a person that's going to come to church and be mad because he did something in somebody else's life and not mine. I'm going to come to church and say, God, if you're passing out healing, thank you, Father, because that just stretched my faith to know that healing is in the vicinity. If you're doing it in this house, you can do it in my house. If you did it for her, let me get close enough to her that when you moved in her, some can rub off on me because I still believe. Kiss this next point, what matters? Is not what others speak over you, but what matters is that you align with what God says concerning you. God already told Elijah where to go, and he told Elijah who would feed him. You missed it. God told 
Elijah where to go and he told Elijah who would feed him. But you got to see the juxtaposition that happens right here. Look at, look at, let's pull up verse 9. L look, I want you to look at verse 9. Can you look at verse 9 with me? I want you to see verse 9 because there's something happening in verse 9 that, that we need to see. Verse 9, God says to Elijah, arise, go to Zarephath. Behold, what? I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Now go to verse 12. And she said, as the Lord, who's God? Y'all going to miss me. She, she, she didn't say the Lord our God. See, that's what's wrong. That's, that's, that's a sure sign that your faith got shaken. Because when he was speaking blessings over there, when he was speaking blessings for you, we believed. But at the moment he started speaking for me to bless somebody else, oh, that's your God. As the Lord, your God, as the Lord, your God lives, I have nothing baked. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug, and now I'm gathering a couple sticks that I can go in and prepare for who? Myself and my son. And we're going to eat and die. In other words, let's go back to verse 9. In other words, God says, Elijah, go to Zarephath. I've already commanded provision to meet you. Verse 12, she says, I ain't got nothing for you. You see the juxtaposition? You see the problem? You see the difference? Because at some point, what God said has to align with what you say. And there's an issue, there's a break, there's a gap because she planned death, but God planned provision. Help me preach Holy Ghost. She planned death and God planned provision. Scripture says that God told Elijah, I've commanded, that's a big word. I've commanded a widow to feed you. But I struggle with the fact that when he showed up to the widow, she said, not me. That's what happens with the people of God. We, we always ready to receive it. Name it and claim it. Speak it over your life. Speak it into existence. But when God says, push out, that's your God. You do it. You, 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 you move, not me. You move. Was it a different widow? Did Elijah go to the wrong widow? No, 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 no. Because, because, catch it now. You got to catch it in the text. Like, we got to really think about this thing. Elijah was told by God, I've already commanded. That, like, commands don't have options. A command does not leave wiggle room. And Elijah has said, has heard from God, I commanded somebody to feed you. When was the last time God commanded you to do something and gave you an option on whether or not you were going to accept? So was it somebody else he was supposed to go see? Elijah heard God about everything else. How did he not know that this was the wrong widow? I, I, I'm struggling. Did she not know that she was supposed to feed him? Because God said, I commanded her. Did she not know? Did she not believe? Why is there a disconnect what, with, between what God says and what we do? Why is there a disconnect between what God says and what we actually do? Why, oof. Why do we have to be convinced by Elijah if she's already been convinced by God? Why do you have to be convinced by the prophet if you've already been commanded by God? Catch this point. Are you looking? Are you looking to be convinced of what God has already commanded to come forth out of you? Nah, that's got to sit on you. Because there's six people in this room 
that God has already commanded things to come out of you prophetically in 2019. Y'all going to miss me. God has, God has commanded finances to come forth out of you. And you sitting back talking about, I don't know. God has commanded healing and wholeness to come forth out of your life. And you walking around saying, ooh, I don't know. Are you sure, God? God already called you and told you that ain't the job for you. That's the job for you. Leave that one and go to that one. And you sitting up there saying, ooh, I don't know. Are you sure, God? Y'all know how we do? I need to go back and pray about this some more. Why? Why? Why do you have to go pray about what God already said? He already said it, and now you're saying, let me go pray about it. Let me see what God is going to say. How dumb are we? God said, do it. And you said, all right, Lord, let me pray about it. Who are you going to ask? He already said it. Who are you going to ask? Whose answer are you waiting on? But see, the problem is, the problem is, what I've come to discover is that church folk have this big, ugly word, this big, ugly C word that's a spirit that hangs over us. And I know you love me and I love you, but you might be mad at me about this one if it hits you, if it step on your toes. Just pray that God deliver us all. Uh, this, this big, ugly C word that hangs over us. And in many people, complacency becomes the default setting of our lives. Oh, help me. And so the default setting for many of us is to be complacent. What does that mean? That I have become so settled in what is mediocre that I don't even want to go no higher. Well, we've been doing it like this this long. We might as well stay. No, the devil is a lie. God called you to greater. Jesus himself said to Peter, James, and John, when they came off the Mount of Transfiguration, they saw Jesus in his most holy form. And when they got to the bottom of the mountain, Jesus said, now you go do greater works. Jesus said greater, do greater than I did. I go from glory to glory. From faith to faith, I refuse to pastor a church of complacent people. When God said, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither has it entered into. Okay. I don't understand how we get stuck saying this is good enough. When God said, I've begun a good work in you. I don't understand. We, we walk through the, the New Testament. We walk through the Pauline epistles and we hear Paul say stuff like, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be in the future revealed in your life. And so I don't understand how we sit still in mediocrity when Jesus is speaking future glory in your life. So complacency becomes the default setting in church folks' lives. But I came to rebuke complacency off you. I came to rebuke complacency off this church. I came to rebuke complacency off your family. I came to rebuke complacency off your house. I came to rebuke it off of your job. I came to rebuke it off your finances. You don't have to stay where you are when God called you to greater. Grab somebody by the hand and tell them there's more for you. God is not done. Come on, prophesy over them. Prophesy over them. Come on, Jews, push it big. Prophesy over them. Prophesy over them. Prophesy over them. Speak into their faith. Encourage them now. There's greater for you. Your best days are not behind you. God is going to do more in you. 
than he's ever done before. Greater, it don't matter where you've been. God has more for your marriage. He has more for your health. He has more for your family. He has more for your church. He has more for your city. So we rebuke complacency. Catch this, catch this, catch this. Complacency is us being marked by self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of dangers or deficiencies. In other words, you don't know you can have greater and you got comfortable in mediocre. And God didn't call you to that. I have a question why do we settle for whatever comes if you have faith that can move mountains? Why do you just settle and take whatever comes if you got faith that can move a mountain? All things are possible to those who shout that word. So if that's the case, why are we settling? If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell that mountain be cast into the sea. Oh. Why are we fighting with mountains when he says speak to it and tell it to go into the sea? Why are you struggling with stuff you ought to talk to? It reminds me of Moses. God says speak to the rock and he hit the rock. You fighting with stuff that you ought to just be telling to get out of your way. There is greater for us. So the widow woman's been hit hard by life like many of us. She's been hit hard by life. Anybody know what that feels like? Right? Like you know what it's like to be hit hard by life. And it forced her to settle into complacency. And she sits here and says, well, I can't get out of this place I'm in. I'm just going to go ahead and eat my last meal and die. Her language was one of defeat. I don't know about you, but I know what it's like for life to hit you so hard that you want to quit. You feel forced to retreat. But I just need you to know that just like this widow woman, God sent a prophet into your space today. I came to tell you that greater is ahead of you. Elevation is for you in this season. Eight people just jump on your feet and receive it. Father, I receive elevation in my life in this season. Father, I receive greater in my life in this moment. Father, I receive that the best is ahead of me. Father, I receive that I will see greater works happen. Father, I receive that you are the God that multiplies. Father, we receive that more is for us. I need somebody in this room to know 2020 is not when God is going to move. 2019 is when God is going to move in your situation. I need you to not be waiting on the next season. I need you to catch that God wants to move in this season. I need you to catch that God wants to do it now. I don't want you to think that God's got to wait. I'm ready to do it now. All right, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. Come on. Shout, my season is right now. Come on. My season is right now. Come on. Woo! Woo! I just felt it. My season is right now. That's why you had so much warfare. That's why he's attacking your health. That's why he's attacking your family. That's why he's attacking your home. That's why he's attacking your finances. Because your word was on the way and he said your season is now. You ain't got to wait down the road. Your season is now. It's turning around for me.
I know what it's like for life to hit you real, real hard. You know, like, I know what it's like. I know what it's like when, like, you get hit and it knock you, knock the wind out of you. And you're like, Lord, I, I'm just trying to find a way to stay faithful. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. That's where this woman was. And God sent the prophet to tell her, you are not going to stay right here where you are. And that's all I want to tell you. You're not staying here where you are. I need to give you these. I need to give you three things and then I'm going to leave. I need you to sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Oof. That's a wave. It's a wave. It's my season. It's my season. It's my season. It's my season. It's your moment. It's your time. sent a prophet into her city and her house so that he could connect what came from his mouth to her heart that's too heavy for me to let go of it miss y'all so I want to give you three truths about confirmation got to write these down these are big for your life the confirmation truths the first truth about confirmation confirmation connects what God said and what you heard we leave it there for a second. We'll leave it on the screen for a second so you can take a picture or write it down. Confirmation will connect to what God said and what you heard. See, see, think about it. Think about confirmation. We always say, is that what God said for real? Is that, is that, God, is that what you want? So like when God speaks, it's not about what he says, it's about what you heard. So confirmation connects what God said and what you heard but feel this because the lady the widow woman she says I only got a little bit of oil and flour so but God commanded you to feed the prophet God commanded you to feed the prophet and then you said so did you hear what God said or did you just need confirmation that that was it so confirmation connects what God has said and what you heard you got that one let's go to number two Confirmation connects what God says, watch this, and what you do. Ooh. Because the first step is to be a hearer, but the second step is to be a doer. So, so it's, it's not only important that you hear God, it's important that you move when you hear him. Right? You got that one? Let's go to number three. We ready for number three? Confirmation, this is the one that steps on your toes. Confirmation is necessary when you don't believe the first time you hear. No, let's be real. Because many times you only need confirmation because you didn't believe it when you heard it. God, did you say that? Is this really what you want? So confirmation comes into play a lot of times simply because we didn't believe when we heard. I'm done, y'all, but I want you to catch this last piece I want to give you. The hard seasons of your life are not meant to break you. They are what God uses to prove that you're stronger than you realized. Ten people in the room right now, you've had a hard season. You've had a hard 2019. You had a hard summer. You had a hard, oh, help me, Holy Spirit. You had a hard few months. You, 
had a hard moment at work. And what you're coming into realizing through spiritual maturity is that God says, this season was not intended to break you. This season was me proving to you that you are really strong. I needed you to see yourself take every punch the devil could throw at you and still keep walking. I needed you to feel every weapon that all of hell could form come right against you and you still keep walking. And so I know I'm talking to a room full of testimonies. I'm talking to a room full of testimonies of health, a room full of testimonies of addiction and struggles and issues and, and all kinds of stuff. And God says, you know what? You overcame all of it. You beat all of it. What was intended to kill you, God used it to prove to you that you're stronger than you realize. I've been through hell, but I'm still here. I've been through drama, but I'm still here. Is anybody still here? <laughs> Come on, is anybody still here? Is anybody still here through hardships? Is anybody still here through your children having struggles? Is anybody still here through health issues? Is anybody still here through disease? Is anybody still, still here through folk walking away from you? Is anybody still here through all the stuff, the financial issues, through unemployment, through heartbreak? Through, are you still here? Are you still here through depression? Are you still here? did miracles we know he did the stuff in the Bible the problem we have is not believing he'll do miracles for other people the problem we have is believing they'll work when we need it because you know what you know what Shonda the reality is it's easy to believe God's gonna do it for you Tasha because I can rationalize if it don't work out the way we thought but you can't rationalize when it's you. Ooh. So we struggle like God's going to do it. I believe God's going to do it. I can shout and dance for everybody else. I can pray for you. I can pray with you. I can stand with you. I can love on you. But when it's my turn, I ain't got that for me. And God said, I only let you see me do it in them. To strengthen your faith to know that I was ready able and willing to do it in you. I need you to change your language to a language of faith. I need faith to be what's coming out of your mouth. You serve the God of all power. You serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You serve Jehovah Jireh, our you serve Jehovah Nisi, you serve Jehovah Rapha, you serve Jehovah Sitkanu, you serve the God of all creation. It doesn't matter what comes against you, your God is able. You might be facing impossible, but with God, all things are possible. You might be facing impossible, but with God, all things are possible. I need you to do me a favor. Where you are, I need you to just start to turn right in your seat. 
because as you turn, I need you to understand in the spirit realm that covers anything you can go through. And as I'm turning, God is turning it around for me. As I turn in this room, God can turn it in my house. He can turn it in my family. He can turn it in my mother. He can turn it in my children. He can turn it in my cousins. He can turn it at work. He can turn it in my finances. As I turn, he turns. He is able. Anybody believe he's able? We got to close this gap, y'all, of what God said and what we say.